thank you very much to the uh, uh, Dravidian Professional Forum for organizing this important event and for inviting me. And I think um, um, both uh, the finance minister's initial comments and um, uh, Dr. Jul uh, Julia uh, Kaje's uh, suggestions, um, I think do a very good job of setting the broad boundary conditions that uh, any democratic society uh, ought to aspire to if it, it really values um, free media. And if it really sees press freedom as an avenue for the deepening of citizens' engagement with, um, you know, social and political affairs and the affairs of the country. So if, if, the, uh, if a government or a polity is committed to empowering its citizens, uh, then it would also have to be in favor of supporting a, a vibrant and free media. And of course, a prerequisite for, vibrant, for, for that vibrancy and freedom is that uh, media have adequate financial resources to be able to um, discharge that solemn obligation uh, of, you know, providing information to to citizens, to readers, viewers about what's happening in society, and allowing them to form an you know informed opinion uh, on this. Uh, so I think that the uh, the suggestions, uh, particularly of um, making, say, the allocation of official advertising dependent on uh, certain changes in governance at the level of media houses is a very good one. And I think the, the idea of empowering ordinary citizens, giving them a certain amount of money which they can spend as they see fit, uh, again, um, I think is a very, a very good way of um, ensuring some degree of financial independence for media uh, without the government being able to use that as a lever. Uh, in India today, uh, sadly, we are so, um, how should I put it? We are so distant from, we are so, uh, we are so far away from these kinds of debates, imagining these kinds of debates, that uh, I often wonder about whether indeed those who rule this country uh, have any interest in um, vibrant media. Uh, if I were to just focus on government advertising, we know that uh, far from using uh, the fair allocation of government advertising, which is after all paid for by taxpayers, right? So it's not the government's money. This is the money of citizens. Um, far from using it in a uh, uh, in such a way as to promote uh, the principles of, uh, of good journalism. Uh, this is used uh, as a means of dispensing favors. It's, it's used to, to punish those uh, me media houses that um, don't tell the official line. And, and sadly, far from striving for changes in governance that would allow media houses to be more independent, more assertive, and to actually be truer to their professional, you know, to their, to their trade craft. Uh, the government actually has a vested interest in promoting uh, regressive governance practices, because the more regressive they are, uh, the easier it is for the government to then um, actually control and direct and browbeat media. Uh, so we are uh, so far removed uh, from uh, the current international debate that I believe democratic societies are engaged in, and uh, the, you know, the, and of, of which the work of uh, Professor Kaji is a is a fine exemplar. That uh, it's hard to believe, and I think often people around the world, when they engage with what's happening in India, they find it hard to reconcile the image of the world's largest democracy with the, with the you know, uh, attitude of the government towards the media, which is um, 
very, very uh, regressive and aimed at, uh, at throttling um, expressions of media freedom that the government, or ex exp you know, expressions of journalism that the government doesn't agree with. So since we're talking about the state of, uh, of Indian media, this is a vast topic. And uh, one, it can be taken in many different directions. We can you know, discuss the, the political economy aspects. We can discuss the legal regulatory aspects. Uh, but I think what I would like to do maybe in five or six minutes is to provide a, just a broad overview of uh, the great uh, paradox of poverty amidst plenty uh, in the media sphere. We have uh, arguably the world's largest number of daily newspapers, the world's largest number of, of news channels. Uh, we don't do private news radio, which is an anomaly. And a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a pretty shocking one, if you consider, um, you know, the, even within our neighborhood, the fact that you have private radio, vibrant private radio, say in Nepal, uh, but in India, you don't have private news radio. Um, but if we look at newspapers, TV, websites, there's no shortage of platforms. Uh, there are literally hundreds and thousands of platforms. But um, what you have, if we were to look at television, is uh, the sort of relentless monotony of not just mediocrity, but of a kind of coverage, I hesitate to call it journalism, that is, um, of course, sensational, but also inflammatory, that uh, uh, happily plays to the government's tune and furthers its agenda. Uh, blatantly mixes news and views. So in other words, has raised editorializing, uh, which Mr. Ram has spent the better part of the last two decades counseling the media against. Uh, television has raised this to a, a, a high art. And uh, in newspapers too, the situation of course, it's, it's, it's slightly better. It's not as bad as in uh, TV, but, uh, but in newspapers too, uh, you find uh, a, a, an unwillingness uh, to actually uh, report critically about what's happening in the country. So the, report critically, particularly when it comes to assessing the government's actions, particularly when it comes to assessing the role of key leaders and individuals like the prime minister or the home minister, there's a great reluctance to, um, to subject these individuals and their policies to the kind of critical scrutiny that uh, any democratic society would expect of its media. And the reason for this uh, reticence on the part of uh, a large section of our print media and virtually the entire section of uh, television barring a few honorable exceptions is that uh, the business model um, that informs, you know, the business model that under under undergirds the, the, the media industry is is one that lends itself to uh, to state capture in one way or the other. Either proprietors uh, are have have multiple business interests, uh, which brings them in alignment with uh, state, you know, government priorities, government policies, or they are risk averse and don't wish to endanger their uh, their businesses by running afoul of the government, uh, or they, uh, you know, are competing for those government advertisements and government favors, and are thus towing the line. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, the political economy of television today, those channels, which are the most um, fervently, uh, which are most fervently establishmentarian, uh, have open support of government agencies in the form of advertising. They also get a lot of private advertising. Uh, you know, they may argue that, well, this is because we are popular channels, but uh, there is actually no objective measurement of uh, you know, the ratings uh, itself, the rating system itself was a scandal. And uh, so, so I think that uh, the uh, section of print and TV, which is holding out and doing its job 
and uh, the Hindu is obviously one of the you know one of the papers that's fighting the good fight. Um, and you you have a lot of digital platforms that uh, simply by by nature of the technology and the lower costs involved provide much less of a handle for the government to sink their teeth into. Uh, so it's it's so so you see a lot more uh, feisty journalism happening um, on the digital on digital platforms. And that's where the government is attempting to, uh, you know, tighten the screws. And I'll just mention two or three things before I wrap up because it's impossible to speak about the state of the Indian media without uh, speaking frankly and openly about the kind of threats that uh, journalists and uh, media houses face today in India. And these threats have far surpassed what used to be the traditional threat, which was of defamation. So uh, every, every editor worth her or his salt by the time of their retirement would have faced several, if not dozens of defamation cases, all useless, frivolous cases, uh, filed purely as a means of harassment and intimidation. And, uh, you know, in a way we, we had, gotten used to dealing with that kind of threat. What's new now is the filing of criminal charges against reporters, against editors for, for journalistic work. In our own case at The Wire, we, we have five or six uh, cases filed by the Uttar Pradesh police, fairly serious charges, incitement of violence and incitement of of uh, insurrection against the government and so on for, uh, for stories that are factual, but which uh, perhaps the government uh, didn't like for one reason or the other. Governments in the past have reacted to stories they don't like by issuing a denial or issuing a statement or, or perhaps using uh, some financial measures to punish a media platform or file defamation cases if the concerned individuals wanted to do so. Filing of criminal charges involving the police, uh, we've seen in Jammu Kashmir, uh, several colleagues arrested and arrested under fairly serious charges. Journalists held under the anti-terror law. Uh, in Delhi, we've seen senior journalists like Rajdeep Sardesai, Mrinal Pandey being accused of sedition for reporting uh, on events that did, uh, that did not um, match what the police wanted, you know, the police version of events. Um, in, in the case of Kashmir, Fahad Shah, who is the editor of Kashmirwala, not only has he been charged under, uh, I think, UAPA, but also under the Public Safety Act. And each time he gets bail, uh, he's promptly arrested again. Uh, so, so this this use this the ease with which the police now are resorting to police cases. Uh, this started the trend started during the early months of the pandemic in 2020, when reporters in Port Blair, Coimbatore, in Punjab, in Gujarat, uh, found themselves being accused of of serious crimes for doing stories that embarrassed the government because they were highlighting shortcomings of the government's pandemic response but has since carried over. And I think the police has become emboldened uh, in, in part also because of the reluctance of the lower judiciary to get involved and to take a stand, a firm stand on this. And uh, so I think that this attempt to criminalize journalism marks a new threat and one that I think needs to be flagged and discussed. And the second uh, change, which I wanted to mention, uh, I think Professor Kaji mentioned it in passing were the new regulations. Uh, I don't know if she had in mind the new IT rules, but the, the new uh, information technology rules, which we believe, uh, you know, we at The Wire have filed a case. I think Mr. Ram has also uh, has filed a case in Chennai um, to, to declare these rules uh, ultra virus of the constitution. But these rules essentially attempt to uh, arrogate to government bureau bureaucrats the right to decide what content uh, is valid and what content is not. And they do this through the instrumentality of, uh, you know, uh, 
weaponizing reader, so-called reader complaints. So if reader, if a reader is unhappy with, with content that's been published digitally, that they, they will then file a complaint with the media platform and the media platform is obliged to respond within a certain time frame. If it doesn't respond or if it responds in a way that does not satisfy the so-called critical reader, then the reader has the right to escalate matters to a government committee and the government committee will then take a final call on whether the story to which this reader has objected uh, should be taken down or not. Now, it, it doesn't take uh, uh, too much thinking to, to realize how dangerous it is to give governments this kind of power, this kind of authority, uh, and how uh, uh, abuse is built into this. So I think this is something which uh, all of us need to fight. We are fighting it in the court. Uh, there are lots of other uh, you know, uh, issues that the media is dealing with, uh, uh, job insecurity, for, for journalists, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the financial insecurity, uh, physical safety in some places like, like Jammu Kashmir in the Northeast, um, uh, you know, which, which also need to be flagged. But I thought I would uh, broadly seek to highlight these two dangers uh, when we speak of the current state of the media, which is one, the, um, the tendency, growing tendency to criminalize journalistic work. And second, uh, the uh, government's desire to accomplish through new rules and regulations what it is unable to do uh, uh, through its, you know, through, through the ordinary, you know, functioning of government, which is to somehow control uh, the uh, kind of news reporting which happens on digital platforms. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Siddharth, for your uh, amazing uh, speech.